and I saw this cloud form. There was nothing there, there was no cloud in the sky anywhere, and all of a sudden, bam, a saucer-shaped cloud right in front of my eyes. I stopped and took the next picture, next, and it disappeared as equally, as quickly as it had formed. There was not another cloud in the sky, there's no lake, there's no water anywhere. It was incredible. I can't explain it, but it's certainly something worth looking into. Next. This is a drawing made by one of the students at Glass College where I was the executive director. Stan was the head of the security department. Some of you know Stan Barrington. He's my only authorized representative in this world. I uh, would put my, hand, my life in his hands, and I have on several occasions. Stan was the head of the security department, and one of the students in the security um, curriculum was in trouble, was failing. Stan was counseling this student, and she drew this picture. And she drew, next slide, this, and next, this, and next, and these little guys. Now, she had no idea that I knew anything about UFOs or flying saucers. Nobody in the world did at that time. Stan didn't even know then, and I didn't even know then that Stan had guarded a flying saucer when he was in Delta Force in the Army. But Stan brought me these things, and he said, you ever seen anything like this? And I said, uh, I don't know, Stan, where'd you get it? And he told me, and we brought the girl into my office and set her down, and I began to tried to find out why she was failing and where this stuff came from, and it turns out she had a year of missing time. A whole year out of her life she could not account for, and she couldn't concentrate on anything, and that's why she was failing. Next. This was drawn by Krista Tilton. Notice the similarity. My student had never seen Krista Tilton in her life, had never read a UFO book, didn't know anything about it. Next. 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 This is Aviation Week and Space Technology, November 21st, 1988. Write that down because somebody's going to ask me. November 21st, 1988. You can find it in used bookstores and libraries. Next picture. In which this ad appeared talking about technology so advanced it will help answer some big question and on the facing page, what's there? This picture. <laughs> on the side of the neck there's hair growing. We did extensive analysis of this photograph. We re-photographed it. We relit it. We, we blew it up. Uh, we tracked down the photographer who would not tell us what it was he photographed. We asked originally to Amico for the name of the artist who drew the picture. They said, I'm sorry, we can't reveal the name of the photographer. We found the photographer. He would not tell us what he photographed, but he sent us an 8 by 10 copy from the original negative, and then we began to work on that, as well as with the ones we had photographed out of the magazine. And there's, this is supposed, this is what Amico told us. They told us several different things. First, they told us that it was a nine foot tall bronze statue Second, they told us it was a 12-foot tall bronze statue. And they third, they told us it was a 9-inch clay statue. When we pressed for more information and became literally obnoxious on the phone, not accepting what they were telling us and wanting to see the original artwork, they refused and hung up on us. So, Whereas I cannot say definitely that this is a live alien, I can tell you one thing, it is not a bronze statue. I can also tell you it's not a clay statue. And hair don't grow on the necks of statues. Next. You can see the moisture in the eye, the incredibly small detail in the texture of the skin and whatever this is, and in the eye. Look at the lip. You ever kissed anything like that before? <laughs> I know a guy that did in the back seat of a Chevy. Next. 
Look at the incredible detail. I have never seen an artist in my life that was capable of doing this kind of work. And I, but I haven't seen all the artists that there are either. Next. Look at the lines on the neck. Look at the detail on the arm. Next. Look at the hair on the neck. Can you see it? It's kind of hard to see, but it's there. That little fuzzy hair. Look at the lips. Look at the throat, the detail, the wrinkles. Next. Look at the moisture in the nostrils and tell me that's a bronze statue. Look at the moisture in the eyes. Look at the incredible detail in the folds of the eyes. Look at this bag under the eyes. Next. I think they're trying to tell us something. Next. Next. These are letters from England uh, that was a big hoax. Next. It purports that a alien craft crashed in the Kalahari Desert of South Africa is perpetrated by one guy named uh, James Van Grunen. Um, it's a total hoax. Don't believe it. If you want proof, write to me. If you, if you think you can waste your time pursuing this, I'll give you, I'll give you the proof. Next. 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 Just keep on going right on through. Okay, next. Oh, this is significant. 1917, the Imperial Japanese Mission, record of the reception throughout the United States, the special mission headed by Viscount Ishiki. John Dewey, professor of philosophy at Columbia University, he's the one who built our education system that is not teaching our kids anything. He said, first sentence in his speech, someone remarked that the best way to unite all the nations on this globe would be an attack from some other planet. In the face of such an alien enemy, people would respond with a sense of their unity of interest and purpose. Next. <coughs> knowing who John Dewey was, and knowing what he's done to our educational system, and knowing that this was written and planned a long time ago, this is probably going on. Next. This is from the report from Iron Mountain. Credibility, in fact, lies at the heart of the problem of developing a political substitute for war. This is where the space race proposals, in many ways so well suited as economic substitutes for war, fall short. The most ambitious and unrealistic space project cannot of itself generate a believable external menace. It has been hotly argued that such a menace would offer the last, best hope of peace, etc. By uniting mankind against the danger of destruction by creatures from other planets or from outer space. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out of our world invasion threat. It is possible that a few of the more difficult to explain flying saucer incidents of recent years were in fact early experiments of this kind. Next. By guys like this. Next, or this, you might know who this is, it's John Lilly, one of the fathers of the CIA mind control methods, next, is this what's going on? <laughs> understanding of what's happening in one, in one very important 